All right, so this morning we're going to continue our conversation in 1 Peter. So if you got your Bibles, you can go ahead and get to 1 Peter chapter 3. My name is Chris Abington, by the way, I didn't introduce myself, so if you're new, um, my job is to lead this house. I do it through vision, direction, communication. It's kind of the task that I've been given. I am an elder with my wife here, and we do that in team, and we do that with a big, broad team around here. So um, deep bench of people that love Jesus and love you. So we're talking in 1 Peter chapter 3, we're going to get through verses 1 through 7. Let me just go ahead and tell you, um, everyone's toes are going to get stepped on. If I leave you out, it's because you got up and left. This is going to get me, it's going to get you. Just go ahead and dig in here. And um, You can't use this, you, can't, you do, can't do this, the only rule this morning is you can't do this and be like, you can't punch your spouse. Because it is some things about marriage that Peter's talking to us about. Only one rule. Not allowed to punch your spouse. Hey, that's, you know, just, just keep, keep it coming like this. Like, this is for me, all right? Just say it. This is for me. Come on, this is for me. We're all going to get on the same page. It's like, a, I got this disclaimer coming. This, everyone's going to get it. We're all getting it. Like, this is a good word for all of us. Let's pray this morning, though. Aren't you, I mean, don't you love baptism, though? Man, kids coming to Jesus, like Anthony and Renee's team, doing such an amazing job. And here in a couple of weeks, this place will be absolutely bananas. I, t- I told them, David, we've got to remind him again, like, uh, no more staples. Like, this whole building was held up by staples last year. And you just turn the team loose, and they go crazy, and this place transforms into, like, a whole nother, whole nother world. And uh, they're loving our kids big. It's like our whole city stops and wants to come to this BBX because those guys do such an amazing job. Um, so if you are and you, you are around and you have time, I can tell you that team will need some help. So if you're around and want to jump in and serve, uh, jump in and get involved with that. That's a big one. Let's pray together and we're going to dig in. Father, I thank you for your presence this morning. Lord, we do celebrate new life with you. God, I thank you that it doesn't get any sweeter or better than that, Jesus, where we come to know you and Lord, the, our whole life, Lord, is like that. We're supposed to walk in this simple grace and faith, God, that we receive grace, God, and we walk by faith. And that's what you told us, Lord. Just as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk you in him. So we're, we're still walking the same way. We're amazed by your grace, God. We're amazed by your grace over our life, God. We're amazed at what you can do, Lord, with broken vessels. We're thankful for your glory, God, that you chose to just put in us, Lord, inside of us. And Lord, we're thankful, for, um, we're thankful for people coming to faith. I thank you for what's happening in our city, God. I thank you for the brightness of your light shining, Lord, as our people go, Lord, and just be, um, be the presence of God in this city. We're thankful for that. Lord, we pray you do more, God. I know you want to reach more, God. I know your heart, so you, you so love this whole world. Lord, I pray, Lord, for this city, God, that you continue to move us, God, into those spaces where... Lord, you don't seem to be present yet. I thank you that we just get to carry your light, Lord, and your life into those places. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so let's read this scripture together. Won't you stand up? We'll read this passage together. It's only seven verses. So 1 Peter chapter 3, starting, in, uh, starting at verse 1. So it's on the screen if you don't have it in front of you. So remember, this is a carryover. So 1 Peter 2 kind of ends with, hey, submit your life to governing authorities, to the rulers, to the people that are over your life, your masters, or in our world, it'd be like your boss. Like submit yourself to that, like give yourself to be under that order, obey the rule and authority that God's placed in your life. Because it wasn't just by coincidence that that happened. Like there is an order to the way God designed things and we're to submit our life under it. And so we begin to pick up in verse 1. It's like a carryover in that same conversation. You know the Bible wasn't written with chapters and numbers beside them like verses, right? It's like a carryover of conversation. So here we go. Wives, in the same way. So in the same way as everything that was just talked about in 1 Peter 2, right? To the end of 2. Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. Your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. For this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to adorn themselves. They submitted themselves to their own husbands. Like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him her Lord, you 
or daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. Husbands, in the same way, again, same thing, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. You can have a seat. So how many of you know, like, if you take some scripture and you pull it out of context of the whole, is how you get abuse, right? And so in the whole world's eyes, this conversation around this and where we'll look here in a little bit in Ephesians when it talks about marriage is a conversation, unfortunately, that gets pulled out and it gets used against the believers because there starts to be this conversation of, oh, you know, there's this whole thing of submission that takes this negative tone and this negative context can I tell you, though, that is not the original design in the abuse of authority and the abuse of power in people's lives. It wasn't the way God designed leadership to work. And so we'd be careful and we'd be right not to throw out something like the word that's so powerful like this just because we've seen it done wrong or maybe experienced it wrong. I've told you that before. We're better if we don't base our theology on our experience. We base it on the truth and let our experience begin to align itself with the truth, Right? That's how, the, that's how that's why the scripture is so powerful. That's why it's alive. If we let it go to work, it will work in us too. Like it'll work itself in and out of our life. Some of these, some of these terms and the terminology, some of the scripture here has just been abused and used for abuse. But for a minute, let's just talk about the context in which this is written in. So if you were here last week, you heard about Tim. These, these are believers in the Roman Empire in like Asia Minor at the time, modern day Turkey. So they're scattered they're living like aliens in this world, so they're being called to live differently even though they're still in the world. Peter's giving them encouragement, exhortation. Hey, live like this. This is how you're going to show your life. This is how you're going to be different. This is how you don't assimilate and look like culture. This is how you still carry the kingdom values in the world that you're in, right? And in this context, even in marriage, women had no rights, zero in this day. Not like they had a little bit, they had zero. For example, like I could cheat on my wife as a husband, no problem, all good and fine. She did, we're, she's going to be stoned to death. I could decide whatever happens to her life. They had no, no, rights in, no rights in the home, no rights in public, zero. And so you've got first century believers coming to faith, living in these cultures, and you've got questions being asked like from wives, I am now a believer, do I leave my husband? Do I now leave the house? Like all of these are questions that are coming in the middle of this context, okay? So don't be fooled. Like the context that they're living in is very, most, uh, very much like where we are in a post, post-Christian culture. Like there's no reference point for Scripture. There's, no, there's not a respect for like, okay, the Word says that. So it's, we're going to have to live this out in front of people for them to see the plan of God which is exactly what marriage, the design of marriage was. Built into marriage, can I tell you, was God's plan. The evangelism is built into marriage. Like it's built into it to display this is what it looks like to have a bride and a groom who love each other, who give themselves up for one another, who prefer one another, honor one another, support one another, serve one another. This is what it looks like, and this is what it looks like with the church and our relationship with Jesus. This is what a real marriage looks like. And one day, praise God, we're going to celebrate a big marriage like in heaven. And I don't understand how it's going to look, but it's going to be awesome. And I'm pretty sure it's going to be a giant party. Like, God's just happy. I mean, can you, it's like a, you, it's like a banquet on steroids. Like, it's just going to be big. Because this thing's been building and is building, and we're going to look at what Jesus said about the bride of this church. So, whether you're married, not married, especially young people before you're getting married and you're starting to experience like relationship, these are things and these are things that are valuable for you and I to know. All right, so built into this was the plan though from the very beginning. Man and, man and wife were gonna become one. Like there was gonna be co- covenant. Because God does everything in promise and he does it in covenant and he does it permanent, that's what it's supposed to look like, permanent. Now listen, if you've been through divorce and you've had things happen in your life, this is God, there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. You walk through that stuff like you get that stuff fleshed out. You get healed like of that stuff, and God restores, and he puts your life together. So don't, don't do the thing where the enemy jumps on shame, and you've been through something here, and you say, oh, I'm disqualified. 
it frustrates me because the enemy's real good at anything that you're going to open the word and see, he's going to be real good to point out anything he can to disqualify you from whatever this word says. That's the first voice that's going to come. Did God really say? Like, that's the old trick. So just hear me. Hear what I'm saying. Don't hear what I'm not saying. If you've been there, there is grace, absolute grace for you. 100%. Absolute grace for you or the gospel isn't true. Okay? You guys straight with that? So these things are made to be equal. So just before we even get into talking about some of these scriptures, how, like, how could this be? How could God create? Think about the Trinity. Like the beauty of submission. So that word submission, to submit, to place yourself under an authority, to obey that that is a God has placed over you. Did, you. did you catch that? It's just to place yourself under. So it starts with our life under God. And then it, we get to see all kinds of scripture that we see about submission. So Jesus submitted himself, we read about, he submitted himself to his mom and dad. Like he submitted himself to his father. You remember the prayer, like in the garden, God, not, not my will, but yours be done. That's what it looked like to have a life that was surrendered, that was willing to submit his will for God's will. Is there any other way? Remember the garden of Gethsemane? Is there any other way for this to work? This is what submission looks like. And it came through, it always comes through, when it's God's design for submission, it always comes through a filter of love. Authority works under the, under the guard, under the headship of love, like that being the primary motivating factor. This is how submission works. You'll never submit and put yourself underneath anyone or anything else if you don't first love that person. And love with love comes the fact that I trust you because I love you. I know you love me. Like, that's what it looks like. And that's why before anyone is even married, so young people, people that are married, in any issues that we see around identity, it's like these are supposed to have been solved before we came into marriage because I don't get that from the other person. I get that from God first because I've submitted my life to God and then whenever I do get married and I am joined together as one with my wife we are submitted to God but she isn't God there is still the submitting my life to God and then there's going to be me submitting myself to my wife now the better I am submitted and loving God the better I am at submitting and loving my wife the better she's there the better she is towards me because this was the design and the order that God had we see submission all through Scripture. He even tells us, submit yourselves one to another. So this is super countercultural, because to submit your life to somebody else means you're giving up some rights that you feel like or you may have. And this is the Christian life. This is the unpopular part of what does it look like when you give your life for someone else? Well, it means I'm going to give up my right to be right in marriage. God knows I messed that one up a lot in the beginning. Most of the arguments would be because I'm right. Am I right? <laughs> it's got to be said after that, right? Tara can tell you. But when this thing's supposed to be mutual the way that it's supposed to work under God's design, and we read these scriptures and we think about it under God's design, the beauty of it, again, when we look at the Trinity, look at how Jesus submitted his life to the Father. And look how Jesus, how the relationship between the Holy Spirit and Jesus, Jesus is like, it's better that I go away and this person, the person of the Holy Spirit would come. Like there's this honor and this mutual honor in submitting to one another. And it didn't discount or devalue the other one because they submitted and honored this one here. The fact that Jesus submitted himself underneath his father and that he's Lord over all and he could have considered himself equal to God but emptied, bankrupted himself, came and humbled himself and became like man, he does that, and none of that takes away from his position. So when we open the scripture and we look at one of the very first lines, it says, wives, submit yourself to your husbands. That doesn't take away any of, <laughs> it doesn't take away any of those things any more than it would have Jesus submitting his life underneath to his father. It doesn't mean that now you don't get a voice. It doesn't mean now that you don't have dignity. It doesn't mean now that you don't have a role. It doesn't mean any of that. God set man up to be head in this house, and he joined us together. He says, wives, submit to this. And it's supposed to work whenever it's underneath the headship. Don't worry, men. We'll get to us in a little bit. Trust me, we have a, we got a pretty high standard for what Jesus commanded, and he said to us. So don't give me, don't, don't lose heart if you're in here and you're hearing something. 
our part's coming soon enough. Wives, submit yourself, though, to this. And why does he even say it? Even if your husband is unbelieving is what he's saying in the Scripture. Even when he says, says even if they're unbelieving, not with your words, you're not going to win them with words. You can put the Scripture back up. They're going to see your action. They're going to see the way you live your life. This quiet assurance that it talks about in 1 Peter. This is how it's supposed to look. There, again, is this mutual submission that happens. But he, he says it because he put man, and he says, I want you to submit underneath the authority here to your wife. Again, the problem is we get it distorted and we get a view that gets messed up because you get unbelieving people or you get well-meaning people or you get some that are just plain crazy and they abuse the power. I mean, it doesn't mean my wife should check with me, can I get up and go to the next room? Can I buy this? Can I show? No, like submitting your life doesn't mean, again, that you give up all of your life and all of a sudden my husband's dictating everything that I do. Listen, there's some crazy people that do some crazy stuff out there. So let's just talk about what submission is not. It's not that. If you're in a relationship and there's abuse going on, it is not that. Let's make sure you understand what it is and what it's not. If that's happening, this doesn't mean I'm going to sit there and continue in that. That is not what I'm saying and that is not scriptural. That can be verbal and that can be physical both. Let me be super clear. That is not okay. Does it, it, submit doesn't mean I follow my spouse into sin. Doesn't mean that. Let's have an open marriage. Let's sleep with other people. No, no. That doesn't mean you follow them into that. Like with the, these are things that are going on all the time in the world around us, right? Like we are still being written to just like the believers here are being written to when it comes to how we live our life together even in marriage. So if you're going to submit yourself there for the young ladies that are out here and you're considering dating and you're considering who you're going to marry at some point, you're going to find someone that's going to lead you towards Jesus. You're going to find someone that's going to be more in love with Jesus. That's if you're going to be submitted under. You be careful who you're going to be submitted under. Am I right on that? Like the whole missionary dating thing. Bad plan. Bad plan. My mom and dad were pretty clear on that early on. Not a good plan. If you're married and you're praying for your spouse who's unbelievable, this is encouragement. Like this word is an encouragement for you to live your life this way so that it's displayed and it's shown. So again, there's been abuse. The call, though, is at the end of this, we see, so let's keep reading a little bit here. So we see, wives in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands, your own husbands. Not somebody else's, not other men like in general. So again, you get an abuse of power, even in our own country, like rights that women should have had way before they did. You get abuse what, to your own husband. Let's be clear, like what we're talking about here. All right, so if any of them do not believe, they may want, be won over without words by the behavior of the wives when they see the purity and reverence of your life. And then he begins to just go into what's this look like? Your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles, the wearing of gold jewelry, or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. What's he saying? He's just saying, listen, women, like, understand your value and where it comes from. Is it wrong to do any of the rest of that? Is it forbidden to do any of the rest of that? No. It doesn't say any of that. Again, you get whole things going on that people take. It doesn't forbid any of it. What's it saying? No matter whatever you do with that, make sure that you understand where your primary source of value comes from. Like, where is the voice? What mirror are you looking at to tell you you have value? Are you looking at it based on images that you see or is the mirror like, okay, this is what God says back to me? It's a really big deal. It's a huge deal. Like, it's the, the enemy's, his job is to steal. To steal what? To steal your worth, to steal your value. To say whatever you are is not enough. Just lies. Like, that comes from the father of lies. And when you look in the mirror of the truth, which is what we're supposed to do, when we look at the word and the word comes and it changes me, what does he say? He says, I love you. I, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. See, O Jacob, I have formed you. I have made you. I have fashioned you. I mean, as a father, you know, there's conversations I'm having with my daughter, and it, it, my daughters, and it's heartbreaking whenever you hear some of the things that happen. 
and you redirect and say, hey, let me tell you though, let me tell you where value or beauty, like where the true stuff comes from. It's always inside, always inside, always gonna be inside. Don't you ever find someone that doesn't value that that's inside, it's inside. I'm saying it over and over, I'm telling it over and over and over. And this is true, isn't it? But it's true, and we begin to value based on something, other image that we see, and we don't look in the mirror, we don't look at the, in the eyes of God, we don't look at this. It will affect us. And women, it will affect you. Everyone knows this is true. We all know it's true. But I love it even whenever we spent some time with our youth and listening to, you know, what God was speaking to them a couple of weeks ago when I did. It was amazing the things that God was saying to them. You are beautiful. You are loved. You are enough. I mean, as they shared just the words that the Lord would say to them, it was beautiful because that's exactly what the truth would say to you. That's exactly what love would say to you. That's exactly what light would do. It would come down and shine and say, no, this is, really, this is really what's going on. This is really true. That's beautiful. That's looking in the right mirror at that point. Amen? You guys good with that? So we gotta, we got to be reminded. When we gotta, and when we gotta cheat, we got to teach, teach our women that. We've got to teach our young women that. We've got to teach our kids that. Because that's the truth. Okay? All right, so let's keep going. Rather, it should be your inner self. For this way, the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to adorn themselves. They submitted themselves to their own husbands, like Sarah who obeyed Abraham and called him her Lord, which is the terminology they would have used in the day for her husband. You are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. Now, this is beautiful. Like When you submit your life to this, so even if you're in a tough situation, so First Peter's already talked about this and he'll talk about it some more. Maybe you're in an un, you have an ungodly boss or you have a something going on in a government that is not the way you would have picked or not the way God would even have designed with abuse. That's what was going on. Say, listen, if you'll submit your life like this and recognize that God is over all and nothing has been put in those places except that he knew it and it happened, which is exactly why Jesus would say to Pilate, you can't even take your life. If you weren't in this spot, you wouldn't be in that spot except my father put you there. This is what it looks like to submit your life under some stuff whenever it's oppressive and it's not going the way that you think it should go. And listen, the Christian life wasn't guaranteed that it was just going to be rosy and easy for us, right? There was no guarantee of that. The guarantee is I will be with you. That was the truth. I will be with you. I will be with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. So even if you're in that relationship, specifically you're married and the husband is not believing in this case, like you submit yourself because you trust God first, because you've submitted to your, you've submitted your life and your heart to him first, and you trust that it's not going to be the words that are going to fix this thing. It's going to be my life that I've submitted to God. And I do that, and I do it without fear. And the only reason I'm going to have fear is if I'm God, and you've got to trust in me and everything that I'm going to do. But if I've placed myself underneath him first, and then my husband, then I, I don't have fear. I don't have fear in that spot. You don't have fear in that place. Because you have submitted to the lordship of Christ over that area of your life, your marriage. And it says, a whole life, do not give way to fear. Which is beautiful. I mean, Proverbs talks about it whenever it's talking about a woman of God, how she laughs. It's like she laughs in the face of the future. Like that's someone who trusts in God, not in the circumstances around or whatever sees where they're naturalized or hears where they're naturalized. She laughs. That's Proverbs 25. She laughs. She laughs at what's to come. Well, you don't do that if you don't have complete trust in God the Father, taking care of everything that affects everything from that all the way down to me. You can't do that if you don't. Amen? Okay, you guys okay? Now, punch your neighbor now, just in the form of wake up, not, hey, that was for you. Like, just punch them to get... I feel like we should take a second. It was pretty heavy. All right, so in the same way, husbands, be considerate as you live with your wives. Husbands, in the same way, and the same way means that we're going to submit. So just because I am the head of our house doesn't mean I am not submitted to my wife. It does mean ultimately I get to make the call because that's the way God designed it. I have never made a call in 22 years of it now. I've never made a call that hasn't had a mutual conversation in place that we've arrived to because that's what it looks like. Even though I may have that, it doesn't look like that. I'm not going to take some stance that's going to go opposite of what my wife views, unless it's, you know, you got to stop playing golf, and then we're going to have to talk to 
we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna have to talk. Like, Husbands, the same way be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner. Weaker partner does not mean women are weak. Weaker partner in this, when he is describing this, you got to imagine the culture they're in, very agrarian, like very much men were working. There was physical labor. So he's, when he's using this in the context, it isn't, he is talking about actually the physical stature like of people. He's not saying, nor would it match any other scripture that you would read. So again, you can't pull that out of context. You're not going to read any other scripture that's going to decide women. It's called women weak. Like you're not going to find that anywhere else. So understand, again, when you read contextually and putting it, letting the Bible interpret the Bible, which is how we're supposed to read the Bible, you will not find that anywhere else. You'll find statements like, hey, there's neither Jew, Greek, male, male, female, like we're all one under Christ Jesus now. That's a pretty level playing field. That's the most leveling scripture I know. So he's not saying it from the standpoint of there's no um, power that they hold. That's not true. And treat them with the respect as a weaker partner. So treat them with respect. Men, treat them with respect. Treat them with respect. Young men, when you're dating, treat them with respect. I, lo- I love it. Like, just a simple thing that I didn't know happened their day. Uh, Noel was with my wife, Tara, somewhere. He's opening the door, closing the door for him. What we teach him, teach him to treat women with respect. Like, I didn't even know she told me he was doing it. I'm like, that's beautiful. Like, teaching them respect. Like, that's what it should look like. As heirs. The reason why you do that is you treat them, but it says, and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life. We get to, we're heirs together. Does that feel like one's of less value than the other? Doesn't sound like it. As heirs with you of this gracious gift, so that, here's a big one, so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Now, this is kind of a, should be an aha for us, men. Because the fact of how I treat Tara has a direct connection to the output, like the answering of prayers that I am praying to God is directly connected to how I treat my wife. This is the beauty of how God designed things to work. Like, this is why you can't be isolated because you can't say, oh, I'm just going to go off by myself and do that. No, you got to forget the great, great commandments were love your neighbors yourself. Like, love the Lord your God, love your neighbors yourself. He, he's connected horizontally and vertically. The whole thing's connected. So my prayer life, the effect of what I pray for and the outcomes of what I pray for is directly connected to how I treat my wife. So we read in Ephesians, pull up the scripture in Ephesians. Let's read um, we'll do this quick. Ephesians 5. I mean, it's one of the most beautiful passages. It's read probably at every wedding. Submit to one another out of the reverence for Christ. So there you go. Everyone, submit yourself to one another. Wives, submit yourself to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is head of his church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. And here you go, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. This is the most beautiful picture of authority of what it's supposed to look like. This is what being the head looks like. Being the head looks like Jesus who sacrificed and gave everything, including his life, for this other person. This is what leading your house husband looks like. It looks like me giving up my rights. It looks like me not going to play golf if I don't need to do that for that day because i got to help with kids or grow shop. It's me giving up my life. It's me giving up my need to be right. It's me giving up whatever it is. It's love because it's self-sacrificing. That's what real love is. It's self-sacrificing. That's what love really looks like. It is less concerned about self than it is the other person. And this is how marriage was supposed to work. And this is how it was supposed to be to the glory of God and a model for others and everything on the outside to see. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing of water through the, through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other, ble- any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, Husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. I mean, when he made us one, he made us one. And when the two became one, they became one flesh. And the, again, the, 
the filter, the model, the imagery to look at is just how Jesus has loved us, his church. You don't have to go any farther than that. So, man, when I said there's a responsibility and there's a weight on what we carry and how we carry leadership in our house, it looks like that. It never, it never comes through some, it never comes through any self-promotion and it's never done out of pride. And in fact, if, if you use scripture to say, wives, submit to your husband, I want to say you got some issues. <laughs> if the guy you're dating springs out the scripture at some point and says, hey, read this, wives, submit your husband, you're going to submit to me, run. Just run from that. Just go the other way immediately. That's not how it's designed to work. You see how beautiful it is, though, whenever they're connected and they're right. And then everyone is in their right place. It's so powerful. But when you try to take on roles that aren't yours, or you usurp, or you step out from underneath that, that's you becoming God at that point. Well, I don't think God knows best. I think I need to take charge, and I need to take control, and I need to make some things happen with my spouse. Can I tell you, that's you not trusting and putting yourself underneath the lordship of Jesus, the authority structure that he's established even in a household. But what's beautiful is the blessing of God and the life that flows when we're rightly connected in our children, in your children's children, like what begins to happen even generationally. I mean, it, I don't know the stat. It's been at over 50% for a number of years of marriages that end in divorce. And we just got to do better. We got to do better. We got to have these conversations that are tough. Again, if you've been there, there's not condemnation in this. Like forgiveness looks like when Jesus, after you bring that to him and there's forgiveness, it, he says he remembers it no more. That's forgiveness. Not even just wipes it off, but restores and puts you back in the right place. So make sure you hear the gospel. That's what the gospel is. But I'm telling you, this affects everyone. It affects everyone around us. The whole world being affected by it. They're just splitting and separating. Most of them, you come down to the root of it, and it's because I've chosen I want this in my way, and I've chosen I want my way. And there's no mutual, there's no mutual submission that happens anywhere in that. Everything about it becomes about my rights, and that person's not loving me the way I need to be loved. And he's being real clear. You're to submit, and you're actually, men, you're supposed to do it like Jesus did, which means I'm going to think about this other person. I'm actually going to love them and act the way that I would towards them, even as if they were doing that towards me. I'm going to choose to do that first. Let me tell you, that's how your problems and that's how your conflict is solved in your home. Whichever party you are, you lay down your rights and you come and you say, I'm going to serve with whatever that person needs. So Rob and Jerry, when she came up, we've been doing a class for, uh, it's been going on, we've done it for several years. Some of you may have taken part in it. It's called Love and Respect. Anybody? Raise your hand if you've been through that course. The love and respect course. Also, this will be new for a lot of you. What's, uh, what's the guy's name, Dr. Emerson? Em Emerson's his first name. Emerson. Yeah, I could never pronounce his last name. Starts with an E. How about that? So in this book like, that, that he's written, it's called Love and Respect. It's about marriage. The beautiful thing is, is they did this study, and out of like 7,000 people that they interviewed, they interviewed 7,000 people about conflict, men and women both. 83% of men come over here and say out of any conflict, they felt like their wife did not respect them. That's how they felt about conflict. And then the women they interviewed out of the 7,000, 70, like 8% said, I don't feel like my spouse loves me. And so he began to see, okay, there's a huge part, like even in Scripture here, if we read to the end of Ephesians, let me just read it for you while we got it up here, I'll read it. You start to see this connection between husbands, if we will love our wives and make sure they feel loved, how you just conflict gets resolved and life looks totally different. In the same way, when men feel respected, how all that conflict dissolves and it just goes away. So in Ephesians, it says this, however, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself and wife must respect her husband. Let me read it again. However, each one of you also must love his wife, talking to men, love his wife as he loves himself so she feels loved and the wife must respect her husband, which is a huge connection. So these guys have been leading this. I just asked them, share, you know, whatever they wanted about marriage that they learned through that, because the reality is you're going to deal with conflict. You're going to deal with it. If you're not dealing with it, we're burying it somewhere, and it's going to volcano on you at some moment. 
because real life happens and you have to have conversations and it, those are real. And how we do that is can be hugely different as believers, like how we're supposed to model that as believers, like how we just read what men do, what women do. How we do that should be a stark contrast to the culture that we're in. Amen? Fire away, guys. I think I know how to work a microphone, right? <laughs> I'm going to let Jerry go first because that's sweet. <laughs> okay. So I just want to start with a testimony. Um, I want to admit to you that hearing those words from Scripture, especially in my 20s, just made me cringe. I just, I had a hard time receiving that. And um, there's three reasons I can think of. One was my mom, and she was, you know, trying to protect me. She wanted me to be able to take care of myself, and she would say, you're going to get an education. You're going to be able to take care of yourself. You don't need to rely on a man to provide for you. She just want, she ingrained that into my head. And I know she meant well, but it put a defense in my soul to that, you know, I can't count on anybody, you know, except for myself. And then um, there have been men in my past that haven't been as honorable as what God commanded them to be and also caused me to not want to provide, you know, just give that respect freely. And then the culture we live in <laughs> has made the scripture an enemy to women in that way. And um, it's a lie, um, and I was deceived by it. I allowed myself to get caught up in that feministic point of view. And what this marriage class has taught me, and you know, I've been reading scripture and I've been praying about it for years and like God helped me understand this. And I will say that this marriage class, Love and Respect, um, Dr. Emerson and his wife just helped me see it from a completely different point of view, um, what it means to respect your husband. And it's not about me cowering down to my husband, but what it's about is me reflecting God's design in marriage, to reflecting the kingdom of God. And it also is something my husband needs. Like, I need to feel loved. My husband needs to feel respect the same way I need to feel loved. God made us male and female for a reason. And um, women have it built in their nature to love freely, unconditionally. It's in their nature. So when God says, women, respect your husbands, he didn't tell women to love their husbands because he put it in their nature to do that so well and vice versa. And what I found is when I respect my husband, he just glows. Um, it just fills him up with confidence. Um, it makes him feel like he can do anything, you know. And I just watch how he receives that as love. And um, it really improves our marriage greatly. And what else can I say about it? Um, I just can see a sense of difference in him in his um, confidence and his motivation to do better, his motivation to do well. And it just, it benefits me as well because that's a lot of power you have as a woman. Um, when your husband does well, it just benefits you all around. So why wouldn't you want that? You guys don't know how hard that was for her. Can you please just give <laughs> She... She doesn't like speaking, if you can imagine that. She, she, she prefers being back there by the projector, and, and I don't mind talking with you guys just like you're all my friends, because you are family. Unless you're new, and that's weird. Now you're family. No, I was kidding. So uh, my name's Rob. This is my lovely wife, Jerry. And um, we've taught the class love and respect a few times now. And um, every time we go through it, we get something better out of it. Uh, I just want to start off with addressing part of what she said, which was uh, there is a, um, a hubris that's applied to uh, the scriptures from a man's point of view, and it's been abused and abused, just like Chris has talked about uh, over and over again. And it's uh, almost stigmatized within our uh, culture that men are... Uh, the ones who will abuse that. And 
and uh, all we can say to that is, well, that's true. We have, we as mankind has, have abused that. But when we refer to scripture, we see even in, in, in Proverbs 31, how a woman is lifted up, how a woman is, is honored at the gates, her children call her blessed and so on. The same thing is true in Proverbs, you know, not even the New Testament. In Proverbs, um, wisdom is referred to as a woman. I mean, what greater honor could you give than to you know, poetically feminize that? So I just want to go back and refer to old scriptures and, and say that women are to be honored. They are to be lifted up. They are to be loved and respected. And I think, well, there's several things that, that we've gone through. We're working on, um, we just celebrated 19 years of marriage. Nobody's more surprised than I am. Right? <laughs> Um, because marriage is really hard, and I look through the social medias, and everyone's posting these great pictures and all this stuff, and it's wonderful, but the truth is that um, I know people, and I know they're falling apart. I know their marriages are crumbling, and it hurts whenever I see people putting on that fake facade to try to make everything okay. And so I would say, and I made a mistake the other day. I clicked on a Johnny Depp Amber Heard video, and now they've been showing up in my feed. And it's like watching a train wreck in slow motion. It's terrible, right? But we were watching part of it, and it was like, they need Jesus. I mean, they just, they just need Jesus. We have had some horrible fights. We have. You're the, how could that happen? Well, it happened because she grew up with a very strong uh, mother, and I grew up with a very strong father. And we, our wills, whenever we come at each other, whoo, yeah. I mean, right after that, for like six months into the marriage, I was like, listen, Satan called, and he wants his demon back, right? <laughs> and she's like, I will throw a brick at your face, and I will not feel bad about that. <laughs> but the beautiful thing about this is marriage for me has been very humbling because I didn't realize how arrogant I was. I mean, yeah, shut up. <laughs> that's, David, that's David Howe, my campus pastor. I love that man. Um, but it's true, though, right, right? It's true that, that um, there's an arrogance and a confidence that comes in. It's, it's, if you're speaking with the Lord, if you're walking in the Lord, it's confidence. If you're walking in the world, it's arrogance. And young men are not taught the difference very often because Jesus is the one who teaches the difference. And I'm telling you, how you submit, or how you, how you uh, take that verse, how you take the verse about submission is going to be whether or not you were taught in the Lord or whether or not you were taught in the world. And I just want to say there's a vast difference. Jesus is all about love. He's all about honor. And in our marriage, he has shown me time and time again that Love is respect. Respect is love. And that I wasn't good at speaking either one of those languages. And so if you guys have problems, not that anybody else has ever had problems in marriage. If you do, though, I would really, really, I want to invite you to come to the next time we, uh, we teach this class. Because it's going to be this fall. This fall? Yeah. See that? <laughs> she knows. Um, it's valuable. We learn so many good things, and, and, and we can implement the things that we learn. And we watch it, and, we, and we've done it several times. And not to mention, we get to bond with the people that are going through the class with us, and that's been a blessing to us also. So I just want to encourage you guys, um, interpret all Scripture through the lens of the Holy Spirit. And when we see things like this, don't forget, love, love and respect will go hand in hand. So thanks, Chris. Yeah, that's good. That's good. <laughs> throw a brick at your face I don't like that that's, that's true stuff I'm sure like we've all been there so let's do this maybe together just kind of in closing I want us to pray I want us to pray for one another we do you know our, our heart ears that we build strong family like that's the idea husbands, wives doesn't matter what let me say this doesn't matter what your generation's past look like it matters what you choose to do 
Like it matters from this point forward how you choose to do life with your wife, how you choose and prefer and honor one another. You get to choose that. It doesn't matter what you inherited in, uh, from behind that you inherited from your past. We've all had it. Like we've all been homeschooled. Just does you don't know what the school looked like in your home. I don't know what your home looked like. It looked different than mine. Everyone's had that, and you have a filter that you came with. But the reality is, like you get to choose what it looks like going forward. You get to choose how this can change. So if your story wasn't this, it wasn't like this godly marriage, guess what? You get to start that. You get to start that and see that flow behind you. If you're part of receiving that and you had parents that modeled it and showed you how to do it, praise God. We need more of that. Like that percentage needs to increase. Like where you walk it out and you show like, hey kids, this is what it looks like for me to ask for my wife's forgiveness. This is what it means for me to be able to do that. For them to see that and know that that's real. Hey, missed it here, messed it up here. See what it looks like for me to honor my wife, for me to be able to serve her. They need to see that, and they need to see her doing the same. I can tell you when that happens and she says stuff to me, if it's ever about a trip or us doing something or doing something different like in job or taking risks, he's like, hey, you, you got it. Like, I know you got it. It's like, that's all I'm waiting on. When I hear stuff like that, it's all I needed. Like, it's all I needed, and off we go. When she shows that and she gives respect, like, hey, you got it. Like, I know it may feel like this. This is what I see. And she speaks that stuff to me. It's like my heart shifts and I'm good to go. Uh, we need that. We need more of that. 